All right, so on our first day of our part two of our Android development course, uh, let's take a, a high-level view of some things before we get into the coding, before we get into the, uh, the development tools and the setup and all of that. So what I'd like you to do first is let's uh, go ahead and open up your web browser and let's go over to this website, developer.android.com. So Android is the operating system that controls your smartphone if you have an Android device. So a Samsung, a Motorola, HTC, LG, uh, what else is there? ZTE, Huawei, etc., etc. There's lots of Android devices out there, but they're all running basically the same operating system, Android. Just like our computers are running the operating system Windows. If you've got an Apple computer, you're running the Mac operating system. If you've got an iPhone, you're running the iOS operating system. And if you've got a Windows phone, you're running Windows. So the cool thing about Android is that it is open source. So that means we can download the source. We can download the code. All of the code is available for us to look at, to edit, to repurpose, etc. And so people can do this, companies can do this. As a matter of fact, Amazon downloaded a copy of the Android code and made their own version of it because all of their Amazon tablets and, stu and such are Android, but they're running a forked, they're running a version of Android. So the Amazon Fire tablet and the Fire phone and the Kindle and all of that, they run Android, but a special version of Android developed by Amazon. And so the great thing about Android is that it's open source and that anyone can use it and anyone can make changes to it. The bad thing about Android is that anyone can use it, anyone can make changes to it. By that I mean that my Android device might not function exactly the same as your Android device because my manufacturer chose to make something different. Maybe Samsung changed something, maybe HTC changed something. So when I say let's go to this screen here and do this and you're looking at your screen and you don't have that, well, blame your manufacturer. They took Android and they changed it a little bit, tweaked it for their version of their hardware. But the great thing about it, again, is that it's available for us to work with and make apps for free. All of the code is here on this site. We're going to be referencing it several times because this is the manual. Remember when we talked about jQuery Mobile last month, I said, well, we can go to jQuerymobile.com and read the manual. We can learn everything about jQuery Mobile. We can read everything about Android, learn everything about Android at this website here, developer.android.com. And you notice there are three main sections here. Design, develop, distribute. In a sense, those are the three classes I teach. The first class is the design class, uh, creating our, our, our main design, our main project, our screens and so forth of our project. The second part is the develop class, where we okay then we have to take our project and actually develop it into a fully featured Android project. Then the third class will focus on distribute. We've got this amazing project. We're ready to put it out to the world. How do we do that? Well, that's part three, and all of the instructions are going to be in there. Just like most operating systems, it evolves. So Android 6.0, codename Marshmallow, recently came out, um, like in the last two weeks or something, very, very recently. So it's so new that most of our, if you've got an Android device, your, yours probably doesn't have it. It's, it's that new, unless you bought a brand new device very recently. So this is one of the challenges that we'll have, that we can set ourselves up and develop our, our project and target Android 6. But then what about those poor people that have Android 4? or Android 3, or Android 2, or Android 1. But we'll talk about the issue of fragmentation and how backwards compatible should we be, and is it worth it, and all of that stuff. But this is the latest one, Codename Marshmallow. If you didn't know, Android has code names, not just a number like Android 1, or 2, or 3, or 5.5. They have code names, and they're alphabetical code names. And they're alphabetical code names that are based on on candies. So there was Android Cupcake, Android Donut, Eclair, 
uh, Froyo, Gingerbread, etc., etc. Now they're on M, Marshmallow. Next one, Android uh, N, who knows what that'll be, Android Nutella or something. But they've got code uh, names based on candies and also a version number like that and also an API number. So we're going to see a lot of like little confusing things here and there as we do our development um, that you'll get used to regarding version numbers and the code and the software and such. But this is, a, this is an evolving project. This is an operating system that controls the largest market share of smartphones in the world. Um, I think it's about 80%. So you might hear so much sound and fury about iPhones, but they don't have the largest market share. They've got about 20% market share. The largest market share is Android phones, be it from Sam Samsung or HTC or Motorola, etc. So if you're developing your apps for Android, you're reaching the largest market share. And because we're developing an app that is actually cross-platform, we will be able to port our app to Android, to iPhone, to Windows Phone, because we're using HTML. We're using a more cross-platform language than the traditional method, which would have focused on Java, Java programming. So we're going to look at this site throughout the course. I'm just making you aware of it, developer.android.com. And to remind you, and to also show you, especially if you're new, that, our, that the end result will be a fully functional, fully downloadable Android app. We can look at examples from previous students' work. Uh, if we go to Amazon.com, Let's take a quick moment, look at Amazon.com, search for MySDCE, you should see a variety of examples of previous students' work that took these classes and published their app with that August 14th, one of the last semesters in the summer that I taught this class, Scott published his app right there and it's freely available to download from Amazon. So you can go to Amazon on your Android device and look up the student's work and download it and actually use it. These are real apps. It's what we're going to end up also by next month. So you can see a lot of examples of students' work. You can uh, click on one of the entries we're going to do all of this. We're going to create icons. We're going to create a store listing. You're going to create your own company, real or not. So quick start prototypes. You're going to make it available for free or not, if you choose. You're going to customize the app. Here it is. Uh, this should look a little familiar, but it's been customized. Different fonts and colors and all of that and other features. The app will have things that our current app doesn't have. The biggest thing about it is that it will be able to um, access a, a database. It will have database features and that we can save content to the app or even to the cloud if we get that far. You'll be able to save, uh, ultimately this class is about saving your class schedule and such to customize a, a educational plan, for example. Now it's funny, I can't focus on that screenshot, it keeps cutting it off, but that screenshot there is supposed to show uh, various input fields and course information and such to save, and then you can pull up the information. It's, a, it's, it's permanent storage in a database. Taking it further, that can be saved to, like for example, an account online with passwords and such. Oh, there it is. So it'll be able to save that information. And all of the students have this. All of the students work has that feature. So people that come in from from the most basic level, um, the Bendra here, I remember he started the class he, he didn't have 
um, any programming experience and he ended up with with his app as well um, and so everyone with all skill levels should be able to uh, to complete this and look at that he's a he's a bestseller he's number 179,000 so this is what we're gonna end up with eventually and notice we're, we're seeing it here on the Amazon App Store but you'd also be able to publish it on the other big uh, Android App Store, Google Play. You'll be able to publish apps here as well. If you go over to googleplay.com, well, play.google.com. If you go to Google Play and search, for example, Instructor Victor, here's an app that I developed to show also students what you can do with what we learn in the class and you'll see here in another app and other ones that are in the, in the pipes um, from myself or my company that that are built with the technology that we learned last month and this month and next month and so you'll be able to publish your apps on either of those two marketplaces Amazon or Google which are huge marketplaces of course the reason though that if you search for for fellow students work here nothing will show up is because in order for you to be published on the Google Play Store you have to pay you have to pay to play even if you're going to give your apps away you have to pay if you sell your apps or you give away your apps on Google Play you have to pay I believe it's about twenty eight dollars twenty nine dollars one time fee to become an official Google Play developer. And so if you choose to pay that, then you'll be able to distribute your apps on this big marketplace. In this class, I don't require you to create the Google Play account, the Google Play developer account. I'm sure we probably can all scrounge up $28, but I don't make it a requirement. So what we will do is we will all go through the process of creating the free Amazon developer account. They don't charge anything. They don't charge anything to be a developer and publish on Amazon. So we will go through this one screen by screen because it's it's totally free to do. And what we learn here will apply also to Google Play. It's just that I'm not gonna say, you know, on day 12, okay, everyone take out your credit card and let's buy the account. You probably don't want to take out your credit card in public and you know, use it here and all of that. So no worries, you can do it at home. But we will create the Amazon developer account. So here's an app um, over on Google Play, screenshots, description, reviews, what's new, updates, all of that, just like a real app. So our ultimate goal in part three of the class is to develop this app and publish it. And to be a, a, the most full featured possible, we're going to learn a lot about the programming. We're going to learn some about the design and graphics and such. We're also going to learn about the publishing it and a little bit of publicizing it. Just because you build a great app doesn't mean anyone will know about it or care. So you've got an app on the App Store, but no one, no one is downloading it. You're getting crowded out. You've got yet another um, you know, social network app. You've got yet another um, gas mileage tracking app. You've got yet another Realty app. How do you get found, downloads, sales and such? Well, that's the publicity aspect. So we will touch on that too, getting our app noticed. Uh, doing some marketing for it because that's the full picture if you're doing this yourself you've got to worry about the coding yes but also the graphics the store setups the uh, distribution of it and the public publication of it in order for it to be known and downloaded and if you're trying to make money off of it to make money off of it that's in month three so many questions so far Okay, so I'm going to close all of that.
the great yes. Oh, I do have one question. Mm -hmm. do, do, does Amazon or Google uh, do any validation when we publish an app? In, in, in other words, you know, if you were to put out something that's pretty bad and garbagey, would they allow it to stay out there? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have the world of Android publishing and comparing that with the world of iPhone publishing. Those are the two big uh, platforms. On the iPhone side, they call it the walled garden because you submit your app, some process happens behind the scenes, they review it, and then they either approve it or reject it. So if they reject it, they'll let you know and you have to fix it and then submit again and then eventually you might get approved. So there's a gatekeeper between your app and the public on the iPhone side. On the Android side, through Google Play, there is no gatekeeper. Anyone can publish anything, which is great and terrible, because anyone can publish anything. But the thing is, Amazon's kind of in the middle. You do have to submit your app, and they do do a quick check, but just basically for compatibility, not really quality. And then it comes out there, and it can be out there within a day. On Amazon, it could be available within, I mean, on Google Play, it could be available within hours. On Amazon, it could be up within a day or two. And then on iPhone, it could be out there in a week. It depends. Maybe a day. Various factors. But the thing about Google Play is that it's sort of, um, in the best sense and in the worst sense, uh, a Wild West, in that anyone can submit anything and it's sort of up to the community to self-police like if I tried to upload uh, if I developed a, a brand new Jurassic World app and I uploaded it it'll probably be up there for a little while and then eventually it'll get taken down because there's always gonna be a button somewhere that says like um, where is it flag as inappropriate so the community polices itself this app works terribly this app stole my information this app is broken people are gonna complain and then Google comes in and um, does something about it so it's sort of like everyone come on into the party and then afterwards with complaints the bouncer shows up on Apple the bouncer is there first before you can even get in on the party apps do get through however on the iPhone world that shouldn't have gotten through either does anyone know or remember the uh, the Shake the Baby game that was on the iPhone. A few years ago, a game came out on the iPhone. You downloaded it, it was a little baby. You would start crying. The way you stop the baby from crying, you shake your phone. You keep shaking and shaking and shaking. And then eventually the baby stops crying. And then little X's form on his eyes. And the app got taken down, because it sounds pretty inappropriate. But it got through the review process. So same thing on, on Google Play, you could upload um, anything you want basically and then it's up to the community to police it uh, and Amazon's kind of in the middle in the middle ground in that it kind of does check your app that it works and I suppose they do a quick check if it doesn't you know violate copyrights and such and then it goes through and then you can also go in and select people can go in and report inappropriate and also give bad ratings and all of that And so in this class, we'll be focusing on developing an Android app because the barriers to entry are much lower. The software to develop the, 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 the apps is free. The, um, the app store to sell is either free or pretty low cost. Comparing on the iPhone, the software is free, but you have to have a Mac to use the software to make your iPhone apps. So first of all, you need a Mac to develop the iPhone version of your, of your project. Even though we created it in HTML and it can go to the iPhone or the iPad or the Apple Watch and so forth, you need a Mac to use the software to convert it to that platform. So that's one barrier to entry right there. Yes, you can use virtual devices if you know how to do that. That's pretty advanced. The second barrier to, to entry is the 
is the Apple App Stores. I also require you to pay to be a developer to get in there, and that's $99 per year. So it's not just a one-time $28 like Google, it's $99, unless they've changed the price. But uh, that's how it's been, and it's pretty expensive, so large barriers to entry. Uh, but our app will be compatible with all devices. If you want to go over to the Windows uh, store, because Windows, if you haven't noticed, has released Windows 10, which is supposed to be their universal Windows, which is one app, works on all devices. So on Windows, you've got tablets, uh, laptops, desktops, uh, their brand new Surface tablets, their Windows phones, their brand new HoloLens, and Xbox, and all of that. So on the Windows side, you're supposed to be able to develop one universal app that works on all devices. So you could, in theory, have your your app that you develop in this class and sell it on, on the Xbox marketplace. Because we are developing our apps with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But in order for that, for that promise of cross-platformness, there's a lot of moving parts. That's why I'm going to have various handouts for you. We're going to take a break soon so we can print a few of them. But let me show you our first handouts. You want to go back to the network folder. Go back to the computer window, network folder. Let's go back to our class folder. You want to drag a copy of instructions 1, 2, and 2B to your desktop. We're not going to need this starting folder just yet. We don't need it yet, but let's look at these handouts. I'll turn the printer back on in the break soon, but we'll do an overview. Let's open up Campus One Java and we need to download various software packages. All of the software packages, if you've already moved ahead, I forgot to say, all of the software packages that we need are already installed on these computers. Don't waste your time, don't waste our bandwidth installing any of the things listed here. It's ready for us because we'd be wasting a lot of time downloading the software. These instructions are for you to try at home on your own computer to install the software. So if it tells you here, go to this website and download this thing, don't do it on our computers. Remember, we've got deep freeze here. That means when you restart your computer, everything you downloaded is deleted. So you're just wasting your time and the bandwidth re-downloading everything. But we will talk about them, the instructions right now. Instruction number one. The first piece of software that we need is the Java Development Kit. It's the foundation for running our virtual devices and for other aspects of the development environment. We're not going to be learning Java. Don't worry about that. We're not going to be learning Java to develop our Android apps. But we need the JDK, Java Development Kit, as a foundation to build on top of. Java is very powerful. You can build Android apps, full-fledged desktop apps. It's very powerful. But for us, we need it to develop our cross-platform app. It's already downloaded and ready to go on our computers, so you don't need to do this. And I just tested this a few hours ago. If you go home, you go to Oracle, you go to these steps, you download the Windows or Mac versions of Java, install it, and then you have to do this. Set the JDK path. Windows needs to know that you've got Java set up. This is not the same Java as the Java you see in your web browser. That version is just a runtime environment. Sometimes you go to websites and it asks you, install Java. Well, that's like the web version of Java. We need the full developer version of Java. It's like a 500 megabyte download. So obviously we're not going to be downloading it in here. It's ready. But then we need to tell Windows, here's where Java is installed. So this is done for us also, but you need to do it at home. One of the things that's going to be a culture shock for most of us when we, when we work in this class is we are using Windows, or you might use a Mac or Linux, and usually it's got a GUI, G-U-I. What's that? What's a GUI? 
graphical user interface. It's windows, it's icons, it's right click. Right? This is a GUI, graphical user interface. What we're going to be using is a CLI. CLI, or CLI, however you want to say it. CLI. What's a CLI? Command line interface. We're going to be pulling up, remember DOS? If you ever use DOS, we're going to pull up a DOS window and type commands. So we're not going to be right-clicking and dragging and all of that stuff like we've been used to. We're going to type a few simple commands. We're not going to need to learn a, a whole bunch of commands. Really, just five commands is all we really need to know. The cool thing about that is eventually, when this is all set up and we get further, we're going to type a command, build Android, and it'll take our code and build the Android app. We can type build iOS, and it'll take the same code and create the iPhone version. We can do simply build, and it'll create the iPhone version and the Android version and the Windows version with just one command. Instead of finding the right icon and clicking the right menu and setting the right setting, you just need to type a few commands. And I'm going to have handouts for you that tell you the five or six commands that we need. But that's going to be a culture shock that we're going to start to use DOS, a command line interface, a CLI, a CLI, to start to shake off some of that fear. Let's do it right now. Let's go to the Start menu. On your Windows search box here, type command, and that'll pull up command prompt. Click on command prompt. Shh, we're doing it the hard way first. Command prompt. Here we go. How many of you ever used DOS back in the day? Okay. So time to shake off those cobwebs. We're going to use DOS. If you've never used DOS before, this is what computers were for like 90% of computer history. Commands that you typed here. Very little user interface except when you made a mistake. Uh, and you had to have a big book that had all the commands listed and you had to refer to it. Now we have the internet, of course. But uh, here it says uh, we're going to get used to this and it's not going to be complicated. But here it's saying, okay, what do you want to do? So uh, just to make sure we kind of are on track, let's say that we did follow instructions one, section one, Java Development Kit, and we installed it. Here's one way that we would check that it, we installed it properly. Here in your command prompt, let's type Java space dash version, and then press enter. J-A-V-A space dash version. Java space dash version. Press enter. We won't do anything until you press enter to enter the command. There you go. If you've never used DOS before, pat yourself on the back. You are a DOS developer now. Um, so here it says Java version 1.8051, which is different from my instructions, obviously, because my instructions have the absolute latest version and, and such. And on these computers, I, we cannot put the latest version between semesters or in the middle of a semester. So if our versions are a little bit different than my instructions, don't worry, it should work. When you do this at home, you'll most likely be downloading and getting the latest one, which I have here, version 860. We have 851. So not a big, dif not a big deal, but we've got Java, version 8. Version 1.851. So we're going to be using this command prompt several times, and I'll have handouts for you and such. But the reason we're doing for this is eventually we will be able to type a command that can be simply build Android, and it'll create our app. Don't type this now because it won't work yet. But we'll be able to just type a command and we'll do it. And a lot of times in modern web development and app development, you spend a lot of time on the command line because this is faster. You memorize a couple commands and you type them. Done. You don't have to load the app, which takes up a lot of RAM. You don't have to go to the right menu, which you forget which one it is because there's so many menus. And then click the right options and such. You just type a command and it's done. We'll get, it, we'll get back to this many times, but at the moment, let's type exit. 
so we can close that scary box and it goes away. We'll come back to it, of course. That's one part of the uh, one part of our setup. We need Java. We've got Java on this computer. We're done. Next, we need something called Apache Ant, which is also used to build a project, to compile, to convert the code into the appropriate platform, to take our HTML project and compile it, convert it to the right platforms. The weird thing about this is, if you saw previously on, on Java, you download a file, you double-click it to install it, and it installs it like a regular app, regular software. The weird thing about a, uh, Ant is that it's just a big zip file. You unzip it. There's no installation file. You just unzip it somewhere onto your computer. And I'm saying in my instructions here, I recommend unzip it, just put it directly on your C drive, and you're going to have a folder on your C drive, C colon backslash Apache Ant 196. As of this writing this morning, it was 196. It might be 197 next month or, or whatever. But we're going to use Apache Ant 196. There's no installation file, so we have to do this, which is set the path. Um, I mentioned setting the path over here also on, on Java, and the instructions are right here how to do that. I'm saying go to start, edit variables, you don't have to do this, but I'm just showing you what you would be doing at home. You're pulling up the system properties, edit variables, all the instructions are here. I tested them this morning. This works on every version of Windows. You've got a Mac. Uh, see me during the break because it's going to be different. But these instructions will tell you how to set the path, basically install ant. We edit some stuff here, there it is, ant home, it's installed. And then we can use ant in our project. What does it do at the moment? Don't worry, but it's some software that we need. Cancel that. Just to see if this is working also, let's go back to that command prompt. And in DOS, in the, in the command prompt, let's check, is ant installed? Remind me again, how do I get back to the command prompt? Start. Search command prompt. And launch the command prompt. We get back to the command prompt and we'll type ant space dash version. Mine says Apache and trademark version 196 compiled on June 2015. Did everyone get that or similar? I forgot to ask when we did Java. Did everyone get Java 51 like me? Or did you guys get anything different? So the software should be, in, both of those pieces of software should be installed on these computers most likely on your home computer, these, this software is not installed. That's why I have instructions for you to do it at home. So that's everything in my first instruction. Download and set up Java, download and set up Apache Ant. Any questions on instruction one? Try it at home, uh, because once you learn how to do it here, it's really good to do it at home, to try it, to make mistakes, to come with questions. I've been teaching this class for a few years now. I've done this whole procedure on a variety of computers throughout the years. Sometimes it works perfectly. Sometimes it's a little bit of a struggle to get it to work. So we'll see with your own computers if you try it. Question? If I already have the uh, consumer version of Java installed, that's a good point. I'm not exactly sure. I would just go ahead and install the developer version on top of the consumer version and um, see what happens. Um, okay, so I'm going to close the instruction number one. You can close the, the command prompt if you want. We'll get back to it again. Remember, exit. You can, of course, click the little X, or you can type exit.
Let's look at instruction number two. This is Campos 2 Android Studio PDF. Let's look at that one. This one is two pages long. We'll do this right after the break. But as a big overview here, I'm saying, again, you're going to go to developer.android.com. You're going to click the button for the SDK. SDK is the software development kit. It's all the code that makes Android work, as well as specialized software to make the code work. Uh, this SDK is a 900 megabyte download that has all the Android code, the software to make it run, and virtual devices. So if you don't have a real Android device, we'll use virtual devices. We'll, we'll, we'll use a little mini Android phone on your computer. And it comes with that big old download. It's 900 megabytes. So this does have an installation file. A couple of years ago, a couple of versions ago, there was no installation file. There was one big zip file that you had to unzip. Um, two versions ago, they finally made a real installation file. Even though Android's been around for years and years and years, there's finally an installation file for it. That goes through a process. Just go through that, install it, defaults. Make a note, number 7 and 8. This is optional, but on number 7 and 8, I say here that there's going to be a part that it says, where would you like to install the Android Studio software, and where would you like to install the Android SDK files? You can leave the defaults, which will install somewhere in your Program Files folder in Windows, in your Apps folder on a Mac, but I recommend to put them on the C drive, the top root level of your C drive, with a folder called Android Studio and a folder called Android SDK. It's totally optional, but on our computers here, that's how it's set up. Simply because it's easier to get to. Because when you've got a DOS box right here, you're gonna, we're going to see that when we need to switch to a folder, we need to type the name of the folder. So if there's a folder called my software packages version 2-3 and I'm trying to go into that folder and oops I misspelled version try again you're gonna kick yourself that you named your folders with huge names so if you simply have folders that have short names you're going to be able to easily go CD Android SDK instead of a huge file, file name that you have to type a huge command for. I'll tell you what I did here, of course, a little later, but that's why I'm telling you in this instruction I recommend putting these two software packages on the root level. Besides that, everything is a default installation. So you just click next, next, next. It'll all be done at a certain point, and then uh, I, I don't want the Android Studio software to start as soon as you click Finish, so I say uncheck that. So don't launch the software right after you installed it, because there's a little bit of other setup that I recommend here. Again, set the path. Setting the path is just let Windows know where is this software installed, so that when we're in DOS and we, and we type a command here, um, if you don't have the if you don't have the path set, typing a command here won't work because it doesn't know where is that command, where am I getting that command from. But if your path is properly set up, you'll be able to type a command as a shortcut and bring up the software. So we'll go through that process. We'll do this right after the. Well, we can do it now. Then we'll take a break. Set up the SDK. Let's actually do this. Um, so, open the C drive, Android SDK. Go ahead and open up a computer window. Computer window here. Open the C drive, local disk C. On these computers, we've got the software inside of Android SDK, Android Studio, and Apache Ant. So let's open Android SDK, Software Development Kit. 
got a bunch of stuff here. But my instructions then say, okay, double click on the SDK Manager EXE. Let's see, SDK Manager EXE, double click that. That's the same thing I pulled up a moment ago with a quick DOS command, isn't it? So here is pulling back the curtain uh, of all of the Android code. Um, if you didn't know, Google currently owns all the Android code, so Google is a big, big company. It's got Google Search, it's got YouTube, it's got Google Maps, Gmail, Android. It's a huge company. And so it's behind the Google operating system. And this Android SDK Manager then lets us download all of the code, all of the software to work with it. Because this stuff gets updated all the time, this is what we would use to update our software to be at the latest version of the code. The problem is we are not going to do any of my instructions here. This is for you to do at home again. So if you already went ahead, cancel that. Don't do any of this here because you're wasting time. When you come back again next time, you'll have to do it again. So don't even do it. I've already set up the software as best as I could because they just released the newest one like two weeks ago. And I had to set this stuff up a month ago um, they don't let me update the software in the middle of a semester. I have to wait at the end of the semester. So we, our software is a little bit old and it's telling us you need to update 19 packages. No, ignore that on our computers here. On your own home computer, you could update your software every time there's a new one. Fine. But on our computers here, we're going to stay with what my software is set up here. And taking a quick look, you've got something called tools. And then you've got these different build tools, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. These are the different versions of Android. As I said, sometimes you see it called Android 6, Android 5, Android Marshmallow. Sometimes you see a, 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 a revision or API number like this. Different ways to refer to the same thing. But here it's saying, well, you need version 24.4. You're ancient with 24.3 there. Android SDK platform. So basically my instructions are telling you at home you would turn off all of the check marks because it it actually wants you to download way too much software. So I'm telling you in my instructions we're gonna unclick un everything and just click on the options that I'm telling you. For example, we don't need the preview code that's that's bleeding edge. We don't need that. We don't need Android 6 either because actually it's it's, it's not the version of the code that we need to develop our apps. We need Android 5.1, which is API 22. API 23 is the latest one, but we're using 22. So don't worry about version numbers and why and all of that. Just make, just rest assured that it all works. I tested it this morning. I've been doing this for years. And um, this is where we would download the latest code. And do you see here we've got things that say, for example, Android TV, system image, Intel 86 system image, Google Atom system image. Those are like the different um, CPUs, the, the different like uh, emulated devices. We can have a virtual Android device running on our computer. We can have a virtual Android TV device running on our computer. I notice here it doesn't say anymore. A few versions ago they also had Google Glass, the Google Glass SDK, which it's not even updated anymore. Um, Android Wear, which was the watch, but it's been integrated to the main core. In short, we've got all of these, all of this software and virtual devices to run it on if we don't have a real device. My instructions tell you what you need to download it's already done on these computers. So there's tools, there's the different versions of Android, and then there's extras. My notes say to install on your own computer something called the Intel Emulator Accelerator, Haxum. If you are going to use virtual devices, 
on your computer. You're going to see, actually, you're going to be surprised that these little things actually are very powerful even if you've got a very new computer. You're going to see that suddenly if you've got a virtual device on your brand new laptop, it's, it might be really slow. You might tap a button and it's really slow and it, and, it, and it stutters and it doesn't react like a real device. That's because usually the, the CPU of these little guys is different architecture than these little guys. These oftentimes use an Intel, a full-featured Intel CPU. And these would use something else like an ARM processor, which is a different kind of CPU. So to make our virtual devices run faster, it's often a good idea to install the Intel Emulator Accelerator. So my instructions tell you all of this. And we'll see when we create a virtual device that this often helps you, speeds up your work. Without that accelerator, you're going to see all of this very slow. The catch is, notice it's the Intel Emulator Accelerator. If you've got a laptop that has an AMD processor, this is not compatible. So this is an Intel Accelerator for an Intel CPU. If you've got an AMD CPU on your computer, this won't help you. So on our computers here, we don't need to install anything. It's all good. On your own home computer, you would follow my instructions as to what to install. Any questions so far? Have you tried this on Windows 10? Um, I've done a different version of it on Windows 10, and it works fine. Okay. Yeah. Do you have to mark developer? No, not on Windows 10 unless you're in well, unless you're installing a Windows 10 app on Windows 10, then you have to turn on developer. But if you're doing a Android app on Windows 10, you don't have to mark Windows 10 as developer. Yes. You can use it, but it might be too slow. Exactly. This Intel one, it's not this is not going to be usable. And therefore, your your emulator might be slow. It'll still run, but it just might be slow. Oh, so we don't have to have. Uh, there's nothing that speeds up the AMD like that. No, and and that's odd since that's been an issue for years. So would, but there's no AMD accelerator. So we wouldn't even install that. Then. Exactly. If you tried to install it, it would say not compatible. So if you don't know if you have an AMD try it and then if it tells you not compatible then you don't have an AMD. Sometimes what also happens is you have an Intel processor everything looks good you install it but then it says you don't have hardware acceleration turned on so that's another kind of topic if you run into that on your own computer talk to me because you'll have to go into your BIOS and change a setting so it's technical stuff but uh, that's what our lab is for. Any other questions on this? Okay close that SDK manager we didn't do anything here you're not going to need to in this room the last thing we'll do here and then we'll take a break is let's actually create a virtual device you probably brought your real device that's fine but let's create a virtual one just to see how that works and then we'll take our break so uh, here we have open your C drive Android SDK then double click AVD manager Okay, we were looking at SDK Manager. Now we want AVD Manager, Android Virtual Device. I will pull up this screen here. This screen will show you all your virtual devices. We don't have any. We can have as many as we want. Technically, we can have five virtual devices running at once if you've got enough RAM and CPU and hard drive space. Because each one of these, it's, it's a little computer. This has a gigabyte of RAM. This has a full, you know, quad-core CPU. Well, if you create a virtual one, it's going to borrow that from your computer. It's going to take two gigs of two gigs of RAM from your main computer. It's going to take one of your cores from your computer. So that's why these things might run slow unless you've got it all properly configured. I don't have any currently configured devices, so we have these device definitions, which are like templates. I have a template to create an Android TV. 
an Android watch, and a bunch of virtual devices. So my instructions here are saying, let's create a pretty low-level device. Usually I create this device on any new computer I'm working on to see how well it handles. If this low-level device handles well, then I create a more powerful one. If that one handles, then I create a more powerful one. And eventually, the device that I create is too much for my computer to handle, so then I know to use a sec uh, you know, the second most powerful device. So my instructions say, let's scroll down and you'll find a device called, very generically, 3.2 inch QVGA ADP2, generic. It's a pretty old device. Click on it one time. This is going to be our template to create a virtual device. Click on it one time, and then on the right side, click the button Create AVD. Here we have several features. This is all in my instructions. We can give this a name. I'm going to leave the name alone, but if I had a bunch of devices, I could call this, you know, Nexus, and this one call it uh, HTC, and call this one Good Device, and call this one Strong Device, whatever. But we're going to leave the default name, default template here, Device Target. On this, switch to the Google API, the Google Code. On the CPU, also select the Google Intel Atom CPU. This is going to create a device that is using an Intel Atom processor. Keyboard is going to use our real keyboard. So we'll be able to type on the keyboard here instead of having to tap each letter on the device. Skin, select the first one, dynamic hardware controls. Our virtual, our real devices have, you know, hardware buttons like volume and power and other buttons. So on our virtual device, we want that, we want that as well on screen. So skin, make sure you choose the first one. These devices, of course, have cameras: the back camera and the front-facing camera. So we can create cameras also. If you've got a real camera, if you've got like a real web camera can actually have your virtual device access your real camera. If you don't have a camera, you can also kind of get something kind of that works if you select emulated. This device doesn't let me get a front-facing camera because it's kind of old. It didn't have front-facing when that device was in vogue. But I'm going to select back camera emulated. Don't change anything on memory options, but that's going to have half a gigabyte of RAM that it's going to reserve for itself from your main computer. And 200 megabytes that it's going to take from your main computer. And we need to pop in a virtual SD card. Doesn't quite matter what we put here. I say in my instructions 99 simply because it's quick to type on the keyboard. It's 99 megabyte SD card. They don't even sell them, but we don't need anything that big. We don't need anything on these options. However, if you go home and you follow all my instructions and your virtual device is very slow, still, make a note. Sometimes it works to turn on Use Host GPU. It'll tap into your graphics processor to try to speed up your virtual devices a little bit more. We don't need it on these computers. It seems to run just fine. But when you try this at home and your device is really slow, and you don't have the Intel CPU, try turning that one on, and it might help you a little bit. We don't need it, so we'll leave it off. And then snapshots are so that we can, so that we can sort of freeze our project at different points in our development. We can make a snapshot at this point, edit our code, keep working. Whoops, that messed everything up. Let's bring back our snapshot to our previous state. We won't actually really use that option because this assumes we're developing with the traditional Java method. We're using HTML and such, so we don't really need it. So we don't need any of those options here. And again, everything that I've just said is in my instructions right there. Click OK. 
You might take a moment. If nothing happens, just wait a moment. It's going to create this virtual device. It might even say not responding for a moment. Just keep waiting. And then eventually it pops up to say, this is the virtual device that we just created. OK. That took us from the device definitions templates tab to the virtual device management tab. We've got one device. My instructions then say, OK, back on that tab, click your new virtual device, single click, and then start. So on the right side, you've got start. Other options here that I'll get back to, just click launch. Right here, it'll give you some feedback. If there's a problem, it'll tell you, but right now it's launching. This is when the rubber hits the road, the rubber meets the road. This is when we see, will your computer handle a virtual device? We're going to wait a moment, then eventually on the bottom here, you will see a brand new app that gets launched. So let's say, I think, like AVD556 or something. So eventually, eventually you'll get a, a virtual device window that pops up. Mine's going to be a little slower because I'm running my recorder, and that takes up CPU. But here we go. I have a brand new app right here, 554. This is going to be like a real device starting up for the first time. You're going to get a little loading animation and eventually the home screen and such. Some of you may see this right away. Some of you may take a while. Mine's going to take a little longer. You're going to compare the performance of this 3.2 inch device on our computer with your computer when you go home. If it's faster, great, you've got a better computer. If it's slower, well, you might not have as good of a computer, and your development process might be slow and annoying. But again, these things are $39 at the moment. So I'm going to wait a bit more. I have a real device. Actually, I have three real devices. Uh, I have this one here, and I like it. It works really well. It lets me test my, my apps. But what if I want to test my app on a tablet? I'm not going to go out and buy a tablet. But I am going to go make a virtual tablet. All right, so eventually, hopefully, you get something that kind of looks like this. Our device is charging. It's 728. 50% battery on 3G. Well, on a real device, when my device is locked, what do I do on a real device? Swipe. What do we do on these devices then? Swipe. Don't touch the monitor. You use the, you use the mouse, click and hold and drag and swipe up. This is like a brand new device out of the box. Make yourself at home. You can put your favorite apps here. Just, click, just tap OK. If you do have a, a laptop that does have a touch screen, this is very cool because you can actually touch it like a real device. We've got a mouse, so click OK. And now I've got this, uh, this home screen. Like I can swipe my screens here. You can swipe screens here too. Click and hold and drag and swipe over and swipe over. Swipe to the right. On my real device, when I want to go back to my home screen, I press the home button, which is right there in the middle. I've got a home button on my virtual device, a little house. That takes me back to my home screen. I've got some apps right here. I've got my app drawer. Click that little circle with six with six um, dots, just like my real device. I've got one right there in the middle. I tap that. I tap that one. It launches my built-in apps. Just click OK there. I can swipe over, see some more apps. Swipe and swipe. If I want to go back home, I tap home. If I want to launch a web browser, so I've got some quick apps down here. Web browser. Click that. This loads up a web browser. 
with a real internet connection. This is not it's not fake. You can actually browse the web right here. You can, it's going to bother you about the app. No thanks. Uh, I'm going to search here. Victor Campos, for example. You can use your real keyboard instead of typing every letter. So you can search like a real Google search. You can browse the real internet like a mobile device. It is loading up real addresses and such. Yes. Now, one, one thing that always trips people up, your scroll wheel will not work. You're going to need to click and hold and drag like a real device. There's no scroll wheel on this. So you will need to tap and hold and drag when you're on a website, for example. Scroll wheel won't work. Oops, too much. But uh, then I go back home. So there we go. How many of you got the virtual device running? Raise your hand. All right, now take that hand and pat yourself on the back. You are an Android developer. <laughs> if it didn't work, we're going to take a break now. Um, we're going to take a break. What you could do is you could go back to your virtual device and why not try to create another device? Why not create one of these fancy Nexus 10 devices or maybe an Android TV device? You can play with that if you want. But it's 7.33. Let's take a break until 7.43. And when we come back, we'll keep following my instructions. <laughs>